it's here. And the second thing that we need to talk about in relationship to yield is the fact that there's each of us are going to have a different um, required rate of return. I'm not even going to look at something if it doesn't yield 3%. I'm not even going to look at something if it doesn't yield 7%. So doing this anticipated yield or expected yield helps me to just see whether something like passes the vetting process, right? Um, so it's got to at least meet or exceed this required rate of return for the same risk class. Okay. Um, and then really the only things that we have left to talk about, I think I told you, um, let's see. I think I told you only to read through section, what, E, D, right? Because then it got really technical. So we're only going to go that far. These The slides that I got from the um, vendor, the, the textbook vendor, goes through the whole chapter. Um, but I only looked at them and changed and added what I wanted to deal with up through. So when I get to as far as we're going to go, that's where we're going to stop. And then you don't need to go any further. So um, really the last couple of things I want to talk to uh, talk about is a little bit more about investing in stocks and bonds. We know that an investor in a, in a company that's traded um, has a right to participate in profits. That's called dividends. If a company's earning of income, the board of directors may or may not issue dividends which is usually quoted as an amount per share, you get you know, 22 cents per share, a buck 18 per share. Um, and then we've talked about how you wanna reinvest those. Um, the three reasons that we um, invest in stock is um, we accumulate, I don't know what that means, a warehouse of value, I'm not even sure what that means. We accumulate capital because it appreciates in value, we get income from it through dividends, um, why is stock a, a potential positive as compared to other instruments like bonds and ETFs and things like that? Um, you've got a really high upside, but you also have a high downside. Um, you can trade them really quick, so there's no worry about liquidity. I want to get out of the market tonight, so I place a sell order, and tomorrow morning my portfolio is liquidated and I can cash out. Um, and there's no direct management needed. Now, this is where um, Philip asked some questions last class pe period about ETFs versus mutual funds. Was it you, Philip? Yeah. And so I kind of looked a little bit more into that because I didn't feel like I gave a very thorough answer. And I realized that I've neglected to tell you two really, really, really important things that are super important. And I can't believe I told you about them. In a mutual fund, Okay, so just backing up here. So if you guys just go buy, um, you know, U.S. Steel, you want something, you know, that's just plodding along, doing its two and a half percent a year, or AT and T or something like that. Okay, do you do you have do you do you have to pay anybody um, to manage that investment, or do you no? I mean, you just buy shares and then it's in your account. You might have to pay your broker a commission. But this is the piece I didn't tell you, which seems pretty glaring error of omission. If you buy a share of a mutual fund, are you paying someone to manage that mutual fund? Yeah, of yeah. course you are. There's hundreds, if not sometimes thousands of different kinds of stocks, right? So you have to be aware of the management load or the management fee. And I just did this, where the heck is that piece of paper? Um, I don't know where it is, but I was sharing with you guys, oh, here it is. I was sharing with you guys on um, Tuesday <clears throat> that I was looking at this potential green sector mutual funds. And I actually went on and I looked up seven of them since I talked to you last. And I'm gonna give you um, what some of their management loads were or the range. Um, the one that we all looked at together, that PBW, um, which I went on to find was really heavy and solar, that charged 0.7%. 
So do the math for me. For every hundred dollars that's invested on an annual basis, how much do I pay the manager of that mutual fund? It was 0.7%. So for every hundred bucks I have in that mutual fund on an annual basis, how much do I pay? 70 cents. 70 cents. Okay. It's like, wow, is this even worth looking at? It is. Why? What does it tell you about what you have to yield to even break even? Greater than 0.7%. I mean, now you've got to cover the commission and a management fee just to break even. You with me? So that's what's happening when you're buying an actively managed fund. Um, so in no particular order, just for giggles. Um, and this just came from, this came from a financial website or blog that I trust. Um, Yeah, I'm not going to go through all this, but anyways, they, they ranged from 0.46% to 0.7%. So between 46 cents and 70 cents. So um, what, so let me segue that. So that's called a 12B or a management load, a 12B fee or a management load, you know, are around this 0.5%. What ETFs, one of the ways that ETFs differ from a mutual fund is because they just follow an, an index. The manager doesn't need to be like, oh, how heavily weighted do I want to be in solar versus wind or green tech versus smart grid? They just pick an index and they weight the composition of their share, one share, to be exactly like the index. So it takes a whole bunch less management. So ETFs will have way, way, way smaller loads, management loads. So that's a big difference. And then the other thing that I quite honestly didn't really know is that ETFs, um, will almost always result in less of a tax liability because they don't, because they follow an index, they're not buying and selling and buying and selling and buying and selling like a mutual fund. And when you buy and sell, you have gains and losses. And if you have gains, which you hope that's what you're paying the manager to do is have gains, then you have a tax bill. Does that make sense? So ETFs are also lower load and lower tax exposure. So, I mean, they're very, very hot right now. ETFs are very, very hot. And it's, I think it's for some of those reasons I just said. So back to the advantages on stock, no direct management needed, disadvantage, you know, risk, we've talked about that, ad nauseum. It's hard to time your purchases. What would any of you advise a newbie when the person says, oh my gosh, I'm scared to get into the stock market because it's so hard to time a purchase. In other words, to buy low. What would you tell them to do? Just enter the market. Okay, but then what would you tell them to do on an ongoing basis? Continue investing like at a set rate. Like, I don't know, you can just ignore the market and be fine. Yeah, and maybe anybody remember what that's called? Holding, buying and holding. Uh, it is, yeah, it is definitely buying and holding, but the formal term we looked at was weighted average investing. Same amount, same weights. In other words, you know, 20% global equities and 30% emerging world bonds and blah, blah, blah. Every month, month in and month out, markets high, markets low, markets in the middle, markets on a weird one day drop in the middle of average, who cares? I get paid on the first and the 15th weighted average investing. I put in the same amount over and over. And then all of a sudden, I don't have to worry one whit about timing purchases, do I? Um, and then another disadvantage of stocks is the uncertainty of dividends because who, who declares those on an annual basis? The stockholders, CEO. It's not actually the CEO. Who is it? 
Anybody the stock the stockholders? Well, no, the stockholders would be like, we want dividends every week. <laughs> who's the who's the party in authority that has the fiduciary responsibility? The board. Isn't it a board of directors? Board of directors, yep. So the board may or may not declare dividends. Um, so go ahead. Do all do these ETFs and these mutual funds, do they all have their own tickers? Like so you can search, so you can search up like what's the hottest ETF right now, and I'll give you a ticker, and then you can look that up on Charles Schwab and you'd see that. Hundred percent. I went in after we had our conversation last Tuesday. I mean, I just I get Honestly, I mean, I just don't follow it as, as closely as I should. But after we had our conversation on Tuesday, I'm like, oh, I'm really going to look into these 10 mutual funds in green tech. So I went into, um, I got the list of the top 10 that a couple different analysts talked about and that I trust. But you're not going to know who you trust. So you just, you know, just start somewhere. I mean, you know, just roll a dice, start somewhere. Look at something that looks credible, right? And you know, and then I went on to Morningstar and like three or four of them were so small, they weren't reviewed. But the other six, I wrote down some stats off of Morningstar. And then I picked up the rest of them on finance.yahoo. And then in my little mind, it's like, eh, I think I want some wind. I want one that's in EVs and battery storage. And I want one that's in solar. And I'll look at them again in a month. I'm not going to follow them every day and be like, oh my God, they're down six cents. Who cares? Right. Don't ever tell anybody that I was giving you an investment advice because I'm not I would get sued. Um, okay, so uh, this is a performance. Can anybody tell us what's the Nasdaq? Michaela, remember what the Nasdaq is? What's that about? You don't need to tell me what it stands for because that's a mouthful. But what's it for? Well, it's like a compilation of the different companies that have stocks. It is, but what, what is the NASDAQ? What kinds of companies are, are, are on the NASDAQ? Publicly traded? The, well, yeah, they've got to be publicly traded to be on an exchange for sure. Anybody know what industry sector it is? Tech. Yeah, it's, pri it's primarily tech. And so the NASDAQ is much more volatile than the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, I'm embarrassed to say, I think that's the top 500 stocks, or maybe that's the S&P. Let's see exactly what that is. The Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, a liquidity leader. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Uh, accept and continue. Um, oh, here it is. It's the same thing as blue chip, the 30 blue chip US stocks. Name one. What's a blue chip stock, Gavin? What's an example of a blue chip stock? Uh, I forgot. I don't know. Sorry. It, it's okay. Just just guess. It's one of the oldest, most stable United States companies. That's okay. Anybody? GM, Disney. Um, I, I'm not sure if Disney's on the. I don't honestly even know, but I know it's like GM, Ford, Johnson and Johnson, uh, okay. IBM, I was gonna... 3M. I was going to pick a Ford, but I didn't know if they were under yeah. tech or something. Yeah, no, they're not. No, okay. car manufacturers are old industrial stalwarts, okay. right? So that's the Dow Jones. So then looking at this, now that we know what the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the NASDAQ are, this is between 2008, 2018. 2008 was, of course, the start of the Great Recession. 2018 um, was pretty much at the height of economic recovery pre-COVID. And look at the NASDAQ, obviously, 
way outperforming um, the Dow Jones. And it's just showing you if you put 10,000 or 5,000 bucks in the market in 2009, it would have been 35,000 by 2018 if you put it in the NASDAQ, 25,000 if you put it in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. But you guys all know that the key, you might not make as much money, but what should you have done if you got $5,000 in 2009? What would you have done with it? One word. Heavily into Netflix. You, <laughs> that's the opposite of what I've taught you. What you're like, I'm all in on Netflix. I'm all in well, on Bitcoin. You would have gotten really rich. You would have gotten really rich. You would have gotten super rich if you'd put 50 or 500 bucks in Bitcoin in September of 2017. You'd probably have your student loans paid off. But that's not what I've taught you. That's called speculating. And if you want to do that with like a hundred bucks, have at it. It's, it's fun. What would you have done? Diversified portfolio. Thank you, Gabe. You would have diversified it. Asher does not get the goal start. Gabe does. But Gabe's just going to have a modest retirement and Asher is going to be living big. So there's that. Or Asher is going to be in the shelter and Gabe's going to be taking care of him. I don't know which way I'll go. Um, I'm not going to go into all this, but the key is, somebody explain this to me. What is a capital gain rate? Give me two sentences. Kate, what's a capital gain rate? I know you know this. We dealt with it during the tax uh, session. Is it the same as your regular tax rates? Higher or lower? Don't read the slide. Look at me. Uh. Lower. Okay, so anybody help her out. What's a capital gain? Shasta, you remember? Isn't it what you get from investing? Like the extra? It very, somebody's on, not on mute. Oh, it's probably Shasta because you're talking. It's very specifically when you do what? This land was for her. Invest. It's when you sell an investment at a game. Okay, you can mute on. I can hear something in the background. It's um, it's it is from investing. It's when you sell it. I bought Coca Cola for ten bucks. I sold it for eighteen. That eight dollars is a capital gain, and I pay less tax on that than I if I do and just go out and make eighteen dollars working at the Coca Cola plant, right? We've talked about the blue chip stock, returns are stable, stocks are less risky. Growth stocks, you should be able, somebody should be able now to convert this to me, convert this for me. Um, anybody, Gabe, growth stocks have high PE ratios and betas in excess of 1.0. What the heck does that mean? Maybe Gabe. Sorry, did you say Gabe or Katie? Oh no, Gabe, please. Katie, Katie's already been put on the spot for the last minute. Um high PE ratios. So they have a high price to earnings ratio. Okay. So that's bad. Does that mean they're <laughs> expensive or cheap compared to their earnings? Uh it means the stock's overvalued. Yeah, it means they're expensive. So you're buying you're buying up at the top, right? If it's got a high PE ratio. And what what's like an average PE ratio over time? Um well, it really depends what market you're in. Yeah. Oh, it does. Good question. Or good I think topic. the NASDAQ's like 24, which is pretty terrible, but that's because that's tech. Uh like 10 to 15. I'm gonna say 15. Let's just look it up. PE ratio over time. Average PE ratio, historical PE ratio, 14, 16, my mind around 15. Okay, of course, yeah, that's it's going to be all over depending upon what market you're talking about specifically. But um, okay, so it's it's got a high PE ratio, which means it's 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 got a lot, it's expensive, and then it's got a beta in excess of 1.0. What does that mean? Um, it's 
in line with the S&P 500? Yeah, we've looked at beta a couple of times, but this is kind of a tough stat. Does anybody remember what it is? It's an indicator of risk. It's not, well, but at one point is it's just following, like it's not any higher risk than the average market. It's, it's only just the average. One. Average. Right. What did we look at that was 0.79? Like, um, oh gosh, I can't remember now. You guys were calling out, like we looked at Delta, we looked at American Airlines and the airlines were up around like 1.9 betas. I mean, so, and, and, but really crazy risky companies might have it like a four or five or a six beta. So growth stocks, uh, you're really looking to reinvest, grow over time, lower no dividends, lots of price volatility, high P ratio, beta in excess of one, and then tech companies. And then this is kind of interesting. I don't know that I would have said this off the top of my head. Some tech stocks have been around long enough that they're considered blue chips. What do you think is an example of a tech stock? Microsoft. That's what, that was what came to my head. 40 years old now, right? Oh, maybe not quite 40. Intel, maybe, or like? Maybe Intel. Maybe Intel. Great. Yeah, 30, 35 year old stock companies or tech stock companies. Highs and lows, but like kind of stayed in the game. Dell, early 90s. Yeah, they might be, they might be blue chips. IBM, maybe. IBM, sure. Yeah, great. Good job, you guys. Anybody remember what capitalization is? We looked at that on the yahoo.finance. So large caps, mid caps, and small caps. Capitalization. Combination of all of their stock value of a company. That's it. Stocks trading for five bucks a share and I got 10 million shares outstanding. My market cap is 50 million, which in my little mind is, God, that's a large company. No, it's not. Small caps is anything under 2 billion in market capitalization. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, the numbers are just so mid cap, two to 10, large cap, 10 or more. And any stock advisor is really going to tell you that. So you say, I want to go into the American, I want to go into American equities. Then they're going to even want you to slice and dice it a little bit between large cap, mid cap, small cap, growth. Okay, dividends, I'm not going to go into this a whole ton. Um, board of directors declares them, usually pay quarterly. You can figure out your dividend yield, which is just basically what do I get divided by how much is it trading for? And that gives you your dividend yield. Um, we've looked at all of these key performance measurements, earnings per share, which is just the net income of the company divided by the number of shares. It's not how much you're getting a check for. It's not how much you're worth. It's just an indication of how well the company's earnings were. And you always see that at the end of every quarter, like January, February, March. So in April, the first quarter comes out. Like right now, they've all just come out. You might see this. The earnings reports, you know, Tesla didn't do as great on its earnings. Google's earnings were fabulous. Um, you know, such and such PG&E's earnings suck because they're still like having to invest all this money after the wildfires. P ratio we know, beta we know. Okay. Do you guys think it's important to diversify globally as well as between stocks and bonds? She Sounds like a good here. move. Okay, why? Katie, what do you think? If you just inherited 10,000 bucks, would you want to keep it nice and safe here in the United States of America? Or would you be willing to see what's going on in Russia or China or India? Um, I have no idea. Yes. Mm, I mean, I'd probably want to look at what's outside, but. Why is it a good idea? Anybody or not? Well, I suppose you're not relying on the success of the United States as much. 
I mean, it's it's like, I mean, it doesn't matter where you stand as far as, you know, I love my country and we're the best and rah, 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 that's great. But from an economic um, globalization standpoint, there is like right now, our economy is lagging behind China by, I don't know, I can't remember what the number was I just saw, 180% or something as, as measured by GDP. Also India, Brazil growth, was, right? sorry. That's by growth rate though, right? By GDP, yeah, by growth rate, yeah. Yeah. Not total GDP. No, not total GDP, I'm <laughs> sorry, yes. G growth, pardon me, yeah, growth, certainly. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is just part, you know, here's the word again, portfolio diversity. Um, the thing that you have that you risk, and I, this is way above our scope, primarily because I'm not smart enough to explain it accurately, but um, you also have exchange rates. International exchange rates just cause that much more risk, right? Oh, what's the yen doing against the dollar? My Japanese stocks are doing great, but the yen just inflated and oh crap, there goes all my yield. So there's that much more to kind of follow. Um, dollar cost averaging that we've looked at that, that's a hundred bucks a month over and over and over. Um, let's see what this shows. Oh, this is comparing stocks and bonds. 15 years between 2004 and 2019. And this is, if I had put $10,000 in in 2005, I would end up with about 35,000 in 15 years if I'd put it in the S&P 500, which is the biggest 500 publicly traded stocks. And I would end up with about 27,000 or 26,000 if I put it in bonds. Why? Why are those numbers different? That's, that's excuse me, $10,000 difference. Bonds have less what? Risk, clearly. Risk return relationship, bonds have less risk. What do you get from a bond every six months that you don't get from a stock every six months? Interest, you get a check every six months. This is why old people like bonds. When I retire, I might keep a little chunk of change just for giggles and do a little stuff with it. But I mean, I've been a community college teacher most of my life and my husband works in nonprofit. We don't have a bunch of money to play with. I want somebody to write me a check every six months right? That's interest. So we'll be mostly in bonds. But when you're young, you want to be more heavily weighted in stocks. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm going to make this short and sweet. Investing in bonds. We know that you get interest. They're not taxed at those preferential rates. So you have to pay just ordinary old tax rates on it. Um, lower return compared to stocks. You know that. This is beyond our scope. I think I'm just gonna leave it with a, just the last couple comments on the different kinds of bonds. This, I mean, you could teach a whole class on this. Um, there's four big markets for bonds. What's the treasury, you guys? Who issues treasury bonds? You know this. Cameron, who issues treasury? I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I can, you can let Cameron answer. I didn't mean to cut you off. That's okay, Cameron? I don't know. Go ahead and let Gabe answer. <laughs> that was a complete setup. It's like, no, no, we're all watching you, Cameron. <laughs> uh, sorry, man. Um, yeah, it's just the federal government, the Federal yeah. Reserve Treasury, yeah. The Treasury, that's the US government. When you see how, when you hear about how in debt we are, right, and how we're spending money we don't have, it literally is because the U.S. Treasury issues bonds, and we all go buy them, and then the Treasury sends us a check every six months, and then 20 or 30 years, they got to pay us back. And every time one of the old from, like, say, the 90s comes due, they just reissue them. So you just stay perpetually in debt, right? So we're not really solving the problem at all. In fact, the problem's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We're just, you know, it would be like if you and I just kept getting more and more and more credit cards. Agency bonds are 
they're called quasi governmental. So they have something to do with the government like Fannie Mae or the VA, right? They issue bonds for very specific groups of people through the government. A municipal bond is like the city of Missoula bought its water system three years ago. And we issued a bond because we had to write the guys that owned the water system, $110 million check. And Missoula County didn't have that or city didn't have that sitting in their bank account. So they went out to the taxpayers, they issued a bond, they borrowed the money, they paid the owners of the water company. And then now every six months for the next 30 years, they have to write a check to people for interest. And then hopefully they'll have the money saved to pay it back. Well, they will have it saved to pay it back because they're taxing all of us more to get that money. And a corporate bonds, just like Google issues bonds. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. All bonds are